In the immense Andean highlands is where you can find Lake Titicaca, the largest high-altitude lake in the world. Its waters are home to mysterious and fantastic floating Euros islands that contain a unique cultural wealth. Of course, this is because their predominantly indigenous inhabitants still maintain their traditions coming from many centuries ago, even before the Incas. That is why many scholars consider Lake Titicaca as the cradle of the sun and the Inca Empire and the floating islands are proof of it. The Uros are several craft floating islands made of aquatic reeds called Totora, where Andean inhabitants live since immemorial time, maintaining their costumes traditions and lifestyle, completely isolated from the world, floating eternally in the waters of Lake Titicaca. The islands are around 60 to 70 in total. However, the quantity may change every year because each island can merge with another or disappear and its inhabitants moving to another larger island and join other islanders. The lake is located in the east of the quiet but privileged Puno City, in the south of Peru. This one is considered the folk capital of the Andean country for its colorful and varied folklore. Returning to Lake Titicaca also spans the neighboring country of Bolivia. In this sense, the Bolivian part occupies 40% of the lake, while the Peruvian part occupies 60%. The Uros floating islands are located west of Titicaca Lake and northwest of Puno, the closest land city to the islands. Also, the islands are located over 12,500 feet. The Uros are believed to be direct descendants of the mysterious millennial culture called Pucara, 1500 BC, whose language was the Pukina, and they inhabited the part of the southern Altiplano shared by Peru and Bolivia. Therefore, many scholars affirm that the Uros were the first inhabitants of Lake Titicaca, even being ancestors of the Tiahuanaco culture. 1400 BC. According to history, the Uros were forced to build their floating islands and houses in the middle of Titicaca Lake when the Inca Empire expanded their lands and threatened them. Being Pacific people, the Uros didn't want to fight. They just wanted to live in peace without threats or foreign influences. So, retreating to the lake to float in the middle of it, far from coasts, was a good way to defend themselves against the aggressive Kalas and Incas. In this form, having their mobile islands, if a threat arose, the Uros could move them to another safe part of the lake, without any problem. With the passage of time, they began to raise cattle on the shores and around the lake, and to trade with the Aymaras, inhabitants of the area around the lake. In this way, their famous language was lost, and being replaced by Aymara. Despite having lost their mother tongue, they still maintain many other aspects of their original culture. The lake is home to numerous legends and stories, but many times reality is stranger than fiction, and this destination seems to be an example of this. There are numerous questions about the floating islands of Uros, but there is a particular mystery that many people want to figure out. How were the floating islands of Lake Titicaca built? All begins by tying roots of Totora reeds until obtaining a solid and light base as the first layer. The Totora reeds are floating at the lake at harvest time, and only men can catch them. Of course, they select the best roots, since those stained with earth can sink very easily. Over the first roots layer, many layers of Totora reeds are piled up until obtaining solid stability. After, they anchor the island by driving eucalyptus stakes attached to ropes into the bottom of the lake. A well-made island can last up to 30 years. However, the Totora reed occasionally disintegrates at the bottom of Lake Titicaca, so the inhabitants, again, mostly men, have to maintain the islands. In the rainy season, it can be added a layer of Totora reeds once a week. On the other hand, in the dry season, it can be added a layer of Totora once a month. Therefore, the ingenuity of the Uros culture was what kept them alive to this day. Even the furniture in their homes is made from this cane. Besides, their boats are in the shape of a canoe, but with animal head decorations on the prow. These usually have two figures of pumas in front, 
to honor the favorite animal of Lake Titicaca. Titicaca means puma stone in the Quechua language. Of course, the boats are used both for fishing and for taking visitors to the islands. In addition, like the islands, the boats are usually moored at the bottom of the lake, but they can be moved if necessary. For all these reasons, the islands are considered one of the most famous landmarks in Peru. As its name indicate, the Uros are floating islands on Lake Titicaca, just a few kilometers from Puno. Originally, the islands used to be in the middle of the lake, but their inhabitants decided to translate themselves and rebuild their islands much closer to shore. This was due to a devastating storm that occurred in 1986. Since this year, many businessmen of Puno began to think of additional forms of lodging for tourists, people who came to Puno to visit the islands, like hotels in Lake Titicaca. In the same way, the Uro's inhabitants began to work in tourism, improving their islands with handicraft markets, toilets, and tourist boats, among others. Returning to the subject, each island has a series of simple houses, although the main island has a watchtower. Small islands have even been created that function as latrines. Despite the traditional lifestyle that the inhabitants live, people are not against modern comforts. Technology and modernization came to the islands with solar panels that reduce the risk of fires from open flames. Also been used these panels for recharging televisions and radios, improving sanitary facilities and other small appliances used by their inhabitants. Even, the Uro's population has a little radio station where Andean music and interesting information about the islands are transmitted. How does a population of floating islands eat? This is an important question that has an answer in the same Totora reads. The Uro's island inhabitants feed through the soft white part of the same Totora that provides them with nutrients. These even help them avoid some diseases like rheumatism and arthritis. On the other hand, they have lived a self-sufficient lifestyle, fishing catfish and trout on the Laque, the hunt of kingfishers, and ibis breeding for egg consumption are their basic sources of food and wealth. Even a few people have cattle that graze on the border of the lake or the same floating island. Three to ten families live on each island, depending on size. These small communities support each other with a deep sense of brotherhood and solidarity. One could say that they form one single island family. On the islands, there is a traditional school and a Christian school that are the main sources of education on the islands. As the kids get older and start looking for university, they will likely leave the lake and head to the mainland to study in Puno. The Uro's way of living is one to marvel at, but is also extremely difficult and steadily disappearing. Many still live in the traditional way hauling reeds into their boats, reconstructing the islands, heading off onto the lake to fish. But many of the young people are leaving and start a different life on the mainland. Daily life here depends mostly around the reeds that grow in the lake. They provide food, housing, and transportation. It is a life of hard work and long days in a harsh climate. In recent years, tourism has become an important part of the Uro economy. People have opened their homes and welcomed visitors from all over the world. Their unique lifestyle and breathtaking Lake Titicaca make the floating islands a must when passing Puno. During the tour, the locals will inevitably try to sell their local handicrafts, a process that feels a little too pushy for some. However, it is important to keep in mind the islanders only keep a very small percentage of tour profits essentially relying on these sales to survive. Also, remember that just being there literally causes their homes to decay and results in the need for a substantial amount of restoration work. Finally, their wares are actually pretty damn good, so consider at least making a small purchase. Although it is possible to visit the islands independently, savings are extremely marginal, so virtually all tourists arrive on an organized tour Upon landing on an island, the locals typically greet tourists while a guide shows them around and explains some of their history and traditions. During the tour, visitors can try on some traditional garb or go for a ride in a Totora reed boat for a small additional fee. 
The islands rotate their hospitality services on a daily basis, with the elders deciding where tourists can visit. Each day, half of the islands allow visitors, while the residents of the other half return to a normal life of hunting, fishing, and making handicrafts. Although relatively uncommon, it is possible to sleep on one of the islands overnight as the guest of a local family. But be warned, facilities are extremely basic with limited access to electricity and running water. Having said that, staying overnight on a floating artificial island is an experience you're unlikely to forget anytime soon. Here is no place quite like the Islas Uros, and if this commodification of their culture means that they are able to preserve it for future generations, then good luck to them.